Hello, everybody. You're watching the Mike Nelson Show. I want to thank everybody who's already subscribed to the channel. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure to subscribe. Um, and thank you for all your support of all the people around the world who have supported uh, this channel. But today, we got a very special guest. We got the legendary Rudy Sarzo. He's been featured on the show before, but today we're doing a full sit down. How are you doing today, Rudy? I'm blessed. How about yourself? How are you doing? I'm doing good. Um, so let's start off my my interviews here <clears throat> with the question: When did your uh, musical journey uh, all begin uh, for you, Rudy? In terms of listening oh, to boy. music and playing, when did it all start off for you? <clears throat> I mean, it's it's been such a long time, you know. I mean, to go back all the way there, but you know, I'll I'll, I'll I'll give you the bullet points. Uh, uh, but it might be too complex for bullet points. So uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, I think that the most important thing about that I witnessed during my journey, I mean, uh, back in the in early 60s, prior to the British invasion, uh, my my family came from Cuba in 1961. We moved to the United States and Miami, the city of Miami. Then we, we were relocated to New Jersey. And it, was, it wasn't it was until I got to New Jersey that I really experienced a, the broad urban uh, fabric of America, especially we were living in West New York, right across the Hudson from New York City. So it was basically an extension of New York. So, you know, culturally, it really mirrored everything that was going on in New York City. And I noticed that there was a lot of separation between the cultures we had in our neighborhoods. We have, you know, like the block where the Irish people live and then the block with the Germans and so on. Just think about every ethnic uh, possibility living in in their own little sections, you know, and then what I what I experienced was that when, once the Beatles came on Ed Sullivan, it it gave everybody in school because in school it was the same, all you know like the Irish hung out together, the Italians hung out together, and so on. And it wasn't until the Beatles came on Ed Sullivan and had that British, that explosion, musical explosion. I mean, I can tell you, everybody from, that I know from my generation. Uh, that is a professional musician would call sit down. And it's that same moment that made us do what we do for, for, our, for our lives. You know, this is our musical journey, which is, which is this is our life right here. Uh, it was that moment. And the next day in school, it broke down all the barriers. All of a sudden we went from combing our hair back with a pompadour to to all of a sudden coming forward with bangs like the Beatles and that signal to everybody else that was affected by it, that we were all part of a tribe. Then all of a sudden, we were all talking to each other, hanging out, going to each other's house, learning about music and going into that, that just, it was a turning point in my life because I, I that's when I learned about different cultures and different, you know, even religious backgrounds and all of that. And it's, it was just the moment that we embraced each other. My generation, the musicians, you know, you know, I, I, I rarely do I meet somebody or play with somebody in a band that we get on stage and there's an agenda, an agenda beyond just making the best music that we can so we can bring all of us together and entertain everybody. We never, you know, I never get up on stage and think, oh, how many people of political parties, different political parties are here or religious belief. No, it's all about, wow, we have an audience and we're going to, we have this collective consciousness that we all gather, you know, sharing that collective consciousness, you know, to hear music. And in my case, playing with Quiet Riot, I mean, I go back to, 1978 when I first joined the band we had a collective consciousness which included never talking about politics or religion not because it was a rule but just that wasn't our focus our focus was getting a record deal and making the best music that we could so we could become professional musicians you know recording and and touring artists so to me music has been 
has been a journey that sometimes when when I tune in to not just social media, but just, you know, television. Come on, I've been watching television since since it was invented. <laughs> I was born in 1950, so... <laughs> You know, I remember when television was like this little, little box, this little, you know, that now we do, we do the same thing with the iPhone. So imagine the iPhone being the only thing in your living room that you're watching, but it's in black and white and really grainy. So, uh, I, you know, we've been bombarded by, by messages from the media trying to program ourselves. And that's the beauty about music. Music enlightens you. Knowledge comes from within. You make self-discoveries of who you are as a human being by what resonates with you musically. And we are what what while I'm playing, everything outside me turn I it, it turns off. I'm in the music. There's, there's no politics, there's no, I mean there's spirituality but not segmented religious sects, you know, uh, it's just one God, you know, and, and God's message and voice and, and, and frequency comes through the music. You know, I mean, I've been studying quantum physics uh, since the lockdown. I wanted to like really explore, really explore what I do. I, I went out looking for the healing qualities of music because I've seen in, in the different bands that I played in, people of different age groups being affected differently by the message and the the soundtrack to the message, which is the actual music. You have the lyrics and you have the music. The lyric to me is the script, and then you have the soundtrack to the movie, which is the uh, the frequencies of the music. And and, and I and and it's like okay, some of them are affected completely different from others, you know, other bands, the audience, and and some of them are just spiritual healing, you know, and I can see it in the audience because the uh, you know I walk I walk on stage and I let's say I'm playing in a in a classic rock band from the late from the sixties and seventies, and the audience is the, that demographic. And they we come on and it takes them a little while to get up and going. And by the end of the set, they're like they're they look and they behave 30 years younger, at least, than when we started the music, when we started playing. They got caught on into the, the frequency and the vibration of what was going on. And it just put them in touch again with their youth and they are experiencing, and that's why they keep coming back. It's like, it's like a time machine. It takes you back and makes you feel young again. Uh, so you know, my musical journey is it's a work in progress. Is I I seek enlightenment, which means information from within that we call, we can all access. You know, it sometimes it just takes looking at the same at the same subject from a different perspective. You know, people talk about 360 degrees. Well, within those 360 degrees, between degree one and two, there's other 360 degrees in there. There's more degrees. I mean, you keep breaking them down. It's like fractals. You keep splitting them, and there's, there's, you know, there's no ending to it. So, yeah. And, you know, people say, oh, yeah, look above. Well, really, above is just where you happen to be 24 hours later, you're going to be in a whole different above. Hmm. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, we keep rotating, you know, our axis keeps shifting on the planet. That's why, you know, we, we get different climates throughout the, you know, the zillion years that the planet has been around has been going through the changes in climate, you know, just because the axis pivots, it just shifts, you know, we're not spinning like this. We're kind of like wobbly. Yeah, you know, and and that creates shifts. And I know because I tour, and I know in this cycle that we're in right now is going to be a, a cold uh, outdoor festival season. Yeah, summer season. I know yeah. because I've been. I was through this uh, thirty years ago. 
with uh, with Weissnake in in 1990 around you know so it's around 30 years ago 32 years ago uh so I know how to prepare myself for that and last year it was sweltering you know but then yeah. again you know we we shift so so this is my musical journey it's 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 more about an enlightenment than just about anything else you know because I seek the truth through music now let's go back a little bit to you know your your childhood. You emigrated here to the U.S. when you were very young. What were some of the challenges you think you faced? Uh, you know, with, with the learning the language and you know just everything. Your whole life, you know, cha changed completely three hundred and sixty. You know, coming out here to the United States, how was that? Well, I mean, you're going to be facing challenges for your life. You know, if, hey, you know, okay. So I uh, when I was a baby, I had the challenge of learning Spanish as a baby. Uh, and then when I came to the United States, I was almost 11 years old, and I was facing the challenge of learning English. And and forever, I will be facing the challenge of learning the language of music. So it's and learning it because you just this, you know, it, the possibilities with music, even though we have 12 notes in our scale, and there's more notes within those notes, but the ones that our ear is trained to listen to, and it's, it, there's so many passive possibilities because you're just not speaking harmonically, you're speaking rhythmically too, and, and, and moods and different combinations and superimposition of chords on top of each other, so, you know, it's just like colors. There's, there's, there's three primary co colors: red, green, and uh, and blue RGB, and and that's where all the colors come from. But not not every, unless somebody's doing a forgery of a classic painting. No two painters paint alike, choosing the same colors. You know, in combinations thereof. You know, so. It's it and 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 again, it's 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 a language. Uh, it's really interesting how, and this is something that I've been studying, something that I'm becoming aware. Of, the more the deeper I get into it, the fact that we have uh, in the universe, we have two two elements, and beyond the universe, I'm talking in in <laughs> in the quantum field, basically, is what I'm getting at. We have two one primary element, which is frequency everything comes from frequency we we vibrate everything that we see vibrates music vibrates uh are we see colors and we see things because of the vibration that the eyes perceive and so on we hear things because of the vibration words i'm, I'm what i'm saying I'm, to convey the message that i'm trying to convey i'm using vibrations from from my throat you know and then as a musician i my journey is all about creating vibrations, but vibrations come from one source, the quantum field. And once that vibration is observed, it turns into a particle, which means it's a thought. You know, it's a thought to create this, this rubber band. Well, this rubber band is vibrating anyways, and that's why they call it also the uh, string theory, where the photons are connected, right? Okay, yeah. so it's all about strings and it's all about vibration, about everything. And not until a consciousness perceives it and imagines something. It's like, you know, the first person, there were no rubber bands until somebody figured it out. Hey, we, we need rubber bands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, then, and then he created the rubber band and people say, wait a minute, this is awesome. Yes, I want a rubber band. But, but before a person perceive the the consciousness of that we need to turn whatever rubber rubber into a rubber band you know now we go and get the rubber out in the whatever the <laughs> like back in the day they had rubber barons yeah. people who make their fortunes with rubber i think wrigley was one of them uh with chewing gum yeah, so income is derivative of of rubber, you know, and then you know it's it's just crazy. But anyways, so so that's you know basically that's that it's part of the sum that makes up how I perceive things and and my you know my perception of my reality from 
the point in in the universe slash quantum field that I happen to be in. Now, why did you pick up the bass and and you know why why not not why not and the guitar or some other instrument? Why did you play the bass? I did pick the guitar. Okay. Um, uh, the bass was picked for me. I, you know, there's there's a lot of musicians, especially back in the in the early days when bass had just become a, a an instrument. It has a history. The popular instrument um, created by by Leo Fender, even though Gibson had basses before that, but they were more kind of like a a a, um, a miniature version of a stand up bass. You know, so it was kind of like marketed to the guys so they don't want, did not want to carry a big bass with them and just have this this bass that that uh like like the uh, original EB had a stand like you could hook up like like a like a stick to put it on the ground and play like that instead of putting strapping it on you know and but the popular the, the instrument became popularized when when Leo Fender made the uh, the first one. Uh, the the precision I I had in 1952, and I gotta tell you, it was the bass has really has not changed that much since Leo Fender came up with, with it, you know, and uh, uh, so a lot of bass players, including Paul McCartney, he was not originally a bass player; he was a guitar player. That uh, his guitar broke, so he started playing piano. The Beatles had another bass player in the band, Stu Sutcliffe. Yeah, and they, they also had a different drummer, Pete Best. And uh, so McCartney, you know, Lennon didn't want to play bass when Stu Sutcliffe left the band, and and George didn't want to play bass, so it, it wound up with Paul McCartney playing the bass. Hmm. You know, and uh, so. I mean, my I I didn't have a band at that time. It was me. I wanted to get in a band, so I told uh, I uh, I had moved to back to Miami, and I walked in the uh, the block the uh, the garage that was that had the each block had a band. You cannot go across the street and join the other band. You have to be in your block. Those were the rules, <laughs> and uh, so I went down and I brought my acoustic guitar with me. And I said, hi, I'm Rudy, and um, I want to join the band. And they go, well, we have too many guitar players. I mean, come on. You know, it was just a bunch of guys with acoustic guitars. And the drummer had a uh, a phone book for the snare and a wow. box for the kick drum. That was, that was the, you know, but, you know, it was a start. And uh, so they said, well, you got to play bass if you want to join the band. And I said, what is that? And one of the guys goes, oh, it's like playing a solo during the whole song. I said, that's me. Sign me up. <laughs> so that's how I started playing the bass. You know, and, and again, you know, it's something that, I don't know. I It took me a little while to really embrace it. Uh, because at the time that I started playing, it was it was like there were so many wonderful examples of great bass playing, you know, because a lot of the records were done by studio musicians, even though you might see a band like, let's say the monkeys. Yeah. But, but on the monkeys records, you had like the best of the best playing performing on that, you know, and Motown, the same thing, you know, there was a jazz musicians that were what needed to make extra money. And they, they became the, uh, the, the studio musician for, for Motown. And uh, this, the, the same thing in the South where the Muscle Shoals or Stax, you know, every single studio or musical movement, you know, Chess Records, Willie Dixon being like the house bass player there and composer, you know, it's, it was, we mostly would listen on the radio to polished, wonderful musicians who, who had been playing even before rock and roll existed. So that that really helped me to define what was good because most of the stuff that you heard was really 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 excellent, and then you would hear some kind of like uh, like uh, Trogs doing Wild Thing, which is not really studio musicians, but it was the band, and and they were pretty much drunk and or Louie Louie would get yeah. another example of like a band actually playing, and that. Uh, so you hear Louie Louie and then hear James Jamerson playing, you know, 
Stevie Wonder song, and it was like, okay, that's different. I can handle Louis Louis. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. And then, you know, and then inspired to get into James Jamerson territory. Yeah. Now let's fast forward a little bit to how you joined Quiet Riot. Um, you know, this is what, 1978 when you joined. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about the story of how you joined Quiet Riot? Yeah. Um, I had seen the band perform at the Starwood the year before, and I had just moved back to L.A. This was my second trip back. Every time I left, I, I was to go out and make some money in, in a top 40 band and then come back. And and uh, so in 1977, I saw Kawhi Riot. I walked into the Starwood and uh, and I saw I saw them play, and I was really impressed. Uh, they had it together. They looked more like an arena band, a band that was ready for to play arenas. Conceptually, their their perception was very together. And of course, the focus of the band was Randy Rhodes. And I was really impressed. So when I saw Kevin hanging, you know, walking around the club after their show, uh, Ke Kevin Cabral, the singer, I uh, I approached him and and like I've done with many bands. And you know, anytime somebody impresses me, I say, hey, you know, you guys got it. Keep keep doing it. Because you know, you just lose sight of what you're doing sometimes if and you're just knocking your head against the wall. And it's good to have somebody get it and tell you, hey, you know. Mm -hmm keep going and basically that's that's what i told kevin i i had told him that i you know i have been touring all over the united states and you guys really got it together and and just keep going you're almost there and um so about a year later they were looking for a bass player and i had been in new jersey uh with my brother's band uh you know lounge act uh just getting some money together to return to uh, to la to give it another shot and uh like a couple of days before i was ready to leave uh i get a call from kevin saying hey man you know uh, everybody tells me that you're you're the guy that we're looking for and and um you know can you come down or audition i say yeah I'll, I'll i'll be there next week i'll give you a call and i went down i auditioned got the gig and that was basically it and i was there until that version of the band broke up in 1979 because Randy left to join Ozzy. But uh, but Kevin put his own band together, Dubro, and I started playing with Dubro on and off and more on, especially when when I moved with Kevin about uh, about eight months before I joined Ozzy. Yeah, uh, eight months before, I, and then I started playing with Dubro full time, and uh, and then I came back. To what is known as the metal health version of the band yeah now did you ever think, yeah now when when uh, the band initially broke up there for for you know when randy joined ozzy did you ever think that the name quiet right would ever come back you know a few years later did you ever did you think is this band done or what did you think about that well what happened was that kevin asked randy and me uh for our blessings for him eventually once the band got signed to name it Quiet Riot again. Mm. And we said, yeah. So we were aware that at some point, Kevin, if he ever got signed, was going to use use the name. Now, fast forward, of course, a, a few years later, you ended up, you know, of course, playing with Ozzy Osbourne. Um, tell me the story of how you, you joined the band, you know, 1981. They, they, the band had just finished uh, recording Diary of a Madman, and they called you up. Can you tell me the story about that? Yeah, pretty much so to me joining Choir Riot. They were looking for a bass player and Randy uh, recommended me. I was the only bass player that they, that Randy mentioned. Hey, you should get Rudy. He checks all, all the boxes for what you guys are looking for, which is basically, you know, not only being able to play and, and whatever, but also somebody who was not going to be a bad influence on Ozzy. So, you know, I, I I I got the call and I auditioned, uh, got the gig, and ten days later we were we were on the road. It was a very short pre-production. Uh, they already had Tommy Aldridge on drums, so yeah, it came it came together. It had to come together really, really, really quick. Now, how did you personally feel 
um, about, you know, the Diary of Madman had, you know, Bob Daisley, uh, of course, recorded the album, but you were on the liner notes. How did you feel about that? You know, yeah. knowing that you weren't on well, the record, yeah. but you were on the liner notes. Yeah. Uh, it was a surprise because we did that photo session yeah. for the tour book. Uh, it was the on the last day of the Blizzard of Oz tour, and we were in Daytona, and Ross Halton happened to be traveling with, with us. He used to travel with us all. Tour book, we're going back out on the road again in about a month and a half. Uh, because that's the break that we took between uh, the Blizzard of Us tour and the beginning of the Diary of the Mad Men tour, which actually started in October in, in Europe. We were... Uh, we were uh, supporting uh, Saxon, L late Europe, because I, I mean, late October, because I remember being Halloween in England still. So we probably just left like one or two days after that. And we started touring in November with, uh, with, with Saxon. And uh, so we did, we did the session, you know, I mean, come on, you know, look at it. it does it look like if, if you look at the cover and you look at, the liners, it looks completely like a whole different image. Yeah. It's like us at this at Disney World mm -hmm. hanging around, you know, like uh, summer clothes because <laughs> it was in Florida and it was hot. And then you look at the at the cover and it's Aussie with that with that look, you yeah. know. And Aussie so looks. yeah, so the, it's so it's like probably, you know, they, they just they needed to stick a photo in there and they chose one of the photos from the uh, from what was the the tour book photo session, and I didn't find out about it until the record was printed. As a matter of fact, I happened to be at the Jet Records office during that time, uh, November or December, probably November, because we came back December pretty early uh, to the United States. So it was probably November, and um, that's when I saw the uh, the cover and the liner notes. And I remember telling Tommy Alders, boy, it's going to be a lifetime that we're going to have to explain this when people ask, you know, why is our photos on that? You know, but hey, yeah, you know, records are printed and, you know, it was beyond my control. <laughs> now, when you joined Aussie, did you have an idea what, we were get what you were getting yourself into? You know, you, you probably had heard stories about you know, Aussie and all that and, and, you know, the whole lifestyle, but did you, did you kind of expect that or was it kind of like a big freight train hitting you the whole change of life well, playing with Aussie? Yeah. I mean, I grew up in an era where there were magazines that uh, celebrated misbehavior from, from, from rock bands and, and, and certain musicians in the bands. So that was part of kind of, of the myth and, so when it started happening, I was not surprised because, you know, spending my youth reading about the crazy antics of Keith Moon, Joe Walsh, you know, any of these guys, it was kind of like, okay, this is, you know, it makes sense. Okay. Now I'm not reading it in a magazine. I'm actually living it. <laughs> and and that's, that was it. But, you know, what, what really helped me through the whole thing, everything, 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 everything was was having a spiritual center. Without that, I I might have been a casualty, just like everybody else. Because you're presented with a uh, on, on a daily basis with possibilities that could actually harm you, possible things to do, and if you have a if you have a spiritual center, you'll be able to like figure it out what's good and what's bad. What just what should you stay away from? Now that year and a half that you were playing with Ozzy and and you know Randy and of course Tommy, do you feel like that was the the highlight of your musical career? Looking back, I mean your career is still going on, but do you feel like that was maybe a a very high point for you? Well, it, it's it definitely set a watermark, but beyond that, I mean it's it you know every band is a different experience because you have different people in the band. And to me, that's what makes makes the humanity of any group is what captivates the audience. 
you know, uh, you know, I mean, it's it, if you look at Ozzy, Ozzy was very, very, the messages, the lyrics and the music, of course, it were reflected by the music itself, but lyrically, you know, I mean, it's, if you listen to Mr. Crowley, it's a very dark song and it stands dark on its own. You don't even have to listen to the music itself. Just re read the lyric. And I had never been in such an environment. Okay, yes, I grew up in Jersey, but Jersey was not Birmingham, England. And and that's where Black Sabbath comes from. A... a uh, a part of England that was industrial. And you add to that that when when Ozzy was born, uh, it was right after World War II, and he grew up playing in the rubble of the Blitzkrieg when German airplanes used to come up and bombard England at night, you know? And it took England a long time to recuperate from that period, uh, you know, rebuild, rebuild the country. It didn't happen overnight. So living in an industrial environment surrounded by rubble is what really created that really dark, dark lyrics, dark music. Whereas I, you know, I mean, yes, I spent some time in New Jersey but there was no rubble, you know, and it was the United States, you know, about, uh, what, in the 60s. So we're talking, you know, over a decade after World War II. Yeah, almost, almost two decades after World War II. And so it was a whole very optimistic point of view. And then if you add me growing up in Florida, which is very sunny, and going to the beach all the time. It was a whole different consciousness that Randy and I had from, from Ozzy, you know. So, the, you know, you, you, you have to, like, really understand where the music is coming from so you can, you can actually accept it and, in a way, embrace it, but not necessarily the lifestyle. Just embrace and... and uh, be aware of its own consciousness because it means a lot to the people that create it. This is, this is their art form. It's like you look at a painting and somebody took what resonated with them and put it on the canvas for everybody to share and look at it, you know, and no matter how bleak the painting might be, I, I respect it because this is coming from somebody's soul, from their inner depths. Now, do you think uh, Randy Rhodes was the, you know, maybe the greatest musician you've ever shared this, the stage with? Yeah, because it was, see, Randy, to, to actually figure out Randy or to actually give him it you know kind of like uh, analyze him today doesn't it, to me it's not fair because he passed away so young and I am aware from playing with him in the band and being with him all that time of where he was at when he passed away but there's uh, there's some bootlegs out there that you can hear him playing closer to when he passed. Because those those records were made back in 80, 81, and he passed away in 82. And he had grown so much musically. He, he would do that every single day. Uh, that it wasn't fair to measure Randy's talent by what you hear in those records. You know? So understanding Randy like 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 I like I do, because I got to play with him in Choir Riot before he joined Ozzy, so I know that version of Randy. And I got to teach at his family school, so I got to watch him and learn how to teach from him. And then the metamorphosis into becoming a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, 
inductee. I mean, there's not many, this, I cannot think of many guitar players that are actually inducted into the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame by themselves, not even the band, you know, and Randy's one of them. So taking all of that into consideration, yeah. And because I had never played with a musician since that has so much musical integrity as Randy did. And mainly because he was born into a musical environment. His mom and dad, music professors, they opened up a school which still stands called Musonia, is in Los Angeles and in North Hollywood. And it was all about music with Randy. We never talked about religion, politics, girls, or anything. It was just like music, always. And I have never witnessed that integrity before that. And that, that integrity was at the core of the choir riot that I play in with him. Uh, just that focus. He would teach for about eight hours, at least a day. Then he would go over to rehearsal with the band and then he will do it every single day. And then on the weekends we would, we would play, uh, we would do shows whenever, you know? Uh, and so there was so much dedication and focus into his, not even a craft art, it's him. He, he was music. What you heard was, was Randy Rhodes. He wasn't trying to cre create something that he was not. It was all come from within, you know? And but he could not do that until until he joined Ozzy, because Ozzy is the one that gave him the freedom to be himself. I asked him. I asked him how how did you how did you go from playing in Quiet Riot, you know, playing the songs, you know, like we're going to have a riot and whatever, to like Mr. Crowley. And he says, well, Ozzy just. I asked Ozzy, what do you want me to write? And Ozzy said, just be yourself. And um, and. See, I used to hear him play classical music, but at school, when he was teaching, in between students coming in, he would pick up the acoustic. He had been playing acoustic guitar before he started playing electric. So he had a, a dance musical background, harmony, theory, composition, playing classical, all of that, that he was able to apply outside of Choir Riot when he joined Ozzy. Now, you were unfortunately present for his tragic death. Um, how did that affect you? And is that something that you never really get over? I mean, how, how do you get move on from that? Uh, well, you don't. You just learn how to live with it. Um, and it's, a, it's an everyday uh, experience because, uh, because, you know, sometimes it just comes back. And you come, I come to the realization that me... Uh, dwelling over Randy's death is not going to bring him back. So what do I do? I celebrate every every night that I stand up on stage with Quiet Riot. It's a it's a perfect example because that's the reason why I'm back in the band to celebrate the memory. I mean that's that was the reason why I went back with Quiet Riot in 1982 after Randy passed away. I I lost the joy of making music. You know, and I right before I was leaving L.A. to go and record Speak of the Devil live in, at the Ritz in New York with Ozzy and Brad Gillis and, and, and Tommy, I get a call from Kevin and say, hey, uh, we're in the studio for a possible record deal. We're making some demos. And how would you like to come down and play on Thunderbird? Who That, that song I used to play with Kevin in Dubrow. He wrote that song when Randy left the band to join Ozzy. And then after Randy passed away, he changed the words to the last verse to reflect, you know, Randy's passing. And so I said, sure. You know, and I, I went down to the studio. Not only is there Kevin, who I had been playing with him since the Randy version of Quiet Ride and Dubro living with him. There was Frankie Benelli, who I have been struggling with Frankie for 10 years since we met. In 1972, on my birthday, November 18, 1972, we started playing together in Florida. And then disco came in. We left. We moved to Chicago. Started playing the whole circuit in the Midwest. 1977, we moved to L.A. And we struggled to keep it together and to, and to find a band and, you know, a situation where we would get a record deal. 
Fast forward to 1982. Finally, 10 years later, we're in the studio recording. You know, so to so be together with again with my my consciousness of the choir riot family, because that was something that it it, it permeated. Uh Randy was a very stabilizing force within the Ozzy Osbourne circuit, the the circle or the family circle of the band. Very hard to penetrate. It was a circle that only a handful of people were part of it, and I was part of it. And of course, Randy and Ozzy and Sharon were right in the middle of that circle. And very stabilizing uh, because of his demeanor, his dedication, his focus, everything about it, everything that he brought to on stage every single night and off stage, you know. And once that that was that was gone, they, they became destabilized, right? And I gotta tell you, the consciousness that Randy brought to all of that that I experienced with him is what still. That's why I've been able to do this for over. I'm I'm on my forty second year of doing it because I learned. I learned from that. He was a, a great uh, mentor, teacher about sustaining a daily focus and integrity in your music every day. So, so when I started, when I went in to do just one song, uh, we tracked it really quickly because I knew it. And then, and then, you know, they say, hey, do you remember Slick Black Cattle? Like, no, remember, I'm still a member of Ozzy at this time. I say, sure, okay, let's do it. So by the time I left the session, I had done like four songs already for for about what became the Metal Health record. And just the, the fact that here I am in the studio with Frankie and Kevin, we share the same consciousness. We have been, you know, we came from the same place, the Sunset Strip. And it just brought back the joy. You know, it was as close as it was to Randy being there, but with not him being there, but still the spirit and the consciousness of it was there. Uh, if you look at the back of the mental health cover, it says dedicated to the memory of Randy Rhodes. That it doesn't get any clearer than that. You know, he was the reason why, why we gathered together. And still 42 years later or 40 years later, because uh, this year we're celebrating 40 years of mental health, the release of, of the record. I do exactly the same thing. I get up on stage, but now I've added Frankie and Kevin to the, to the bandmates that I go to celebrate the legacy and the memory of on stage. Now, when you were making mental health, did you think you had something special, an album that would you know live on for decades when you were making it? Not necessarily, but but we see it was different times. So what what was separated me from the other guys is that I had been on tour with Ozzy, and on which I experienced the up and coming bands. You know, we had Def Leppard opening up for us in the and the uh, Blizzard of Us tour. We had Motorhead. These these were these were to become icons. So, you know, you become familiar with that, right? Uh, by the time that I played in England and, and, and Europe with Ozzy, you know, I have, I have seen bands that what became the new, the new wave of British metal. Uh, I have seen them before they became icons again, you know, from uh, Iron Maiden to We Tour with Saxon. I mean, there was so much music, Judas Priest, uh, so, so I knew we used to go, Randy and I, we used to, every time we would return to LA on a break from Ozzy, we will pick up Kevin, take him to the rainbow, give him an update of what's going on out there. And we knew, we knew that, that there were certain parallels to what Kevin was doing with his band Dubrow that reflected on bands, especially like Def Leppard, you know, were doing. And we kept telling Kevin, listen, you know, keep doing what you're doing because we're on tour with this band, Death Leopard, and they're getting a lot of attention and doing really good. So, you know, you're on the right track. So, yeah, we knew that there were certain uh, 
elements to the music that were going to appeal to a demographic. Now, how big the appeal was, it was, we couldn't tell because at that time, MTV wasn't really a major player yet. You know, um, as a matter of fact, I, 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 and with Ozzy, we did the last show in the continental U.S. for the Diary of a Madman tour was at Irvine in Los Angeles. It's called, it was called Irvine at the time. I don't know what it's called now. It's an amphitheater. And uh, we did that and we videoed it and it was premiered uh, on MTV Halloween night of 1982. And that was kind of like a big, a big, a big deal because, you know, MT was just coming out. They was trying to gain some homes because they just did not explode immediately. It, it took, it took a bit for all the, all the outlets to actually offer MTV that you have to pay extra for that. It, it wasn't part of your basic cable program, you know, uh, pricing. So a lot of families didn't, could not afford it. They not wanted it. They not needed it. So, so it took a while for MTV. Uh, but once MTV hit in 1983 with when Metal Health was out, and of course, you know, Thriller and the Death Leopard record about Pyromania, it really, really helped. And, you know, what was considered a hit to go gold, now it was multi, multi platinum. You know, and we, we, we became beneficiaries from that. Quiet Riot, you know. Now, May 29th, uh, 1983, is going to be uh, five days from now. Uh, 40 years ago, Quiet Riot played at the US Festival. Can you tell me a little yeah. bit about that festival and its importance to the music to musical history? Yeah, I mean, I can't tell you a little. <laughs> it's a lot to be said. But uh, but in a nutshell, I mean, we were at it uh, two days before the show, and uh, it, it was something, that it, it was like a ripple effect. You did not really ex knew what it, what the value of it until later on, because it was, it just kept resonating. I mean, 40 years later, we're still talking about it, you know. Uh, we knew we knew that it was going to be film. It took a long time for the filming to to be available because certain bands were not ready to release to agree to having their footage. So you needed those certain bands in order to, to have a complete package of the US festival performance. And of course, 40 years ago, there was no streaming media. You can watch that that performance right now on yeah. YouTube for free, yeah. you know, which means that, you know, it gets exposed to new generations who might not, who might not even have an idea of, of what it took to put the event together 40 years ago. Now it's very common to have those, those, you know, major festival 40 years ago. It wasn't, you know, a, a three day festival like that. Uh, they have been Woodstock, Woodstock, that's about it. That's a festival like that. It was Monterey Pop, but that was a continue. Monterey Pop was more of a jazz festival, and then they did like a like the pop rock festival. And then you had uh, Altamont, which was a one-time only <laughs> festival, you know, with with the Stones and and uh, you know and and the Hell's Angels and all that. Yeah. And but 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 uh. The US Festival, there had been a 1982 US Festival and then the 1983. And, and that that was used as promotion to market the new Apple computer. You know, uh, Wozniak was the uh, the key element of putting of, of that show. And I got to meet him decades later and thank him for, for having us. And uh, so, yeah, I, it, it, you know, it was being part of a cultural phenomenon. Uh, the US Festival, but we just, you know, we did it. As a matter of fact, we, we didn't even know. I didn't even know about the US Festival until the promoter, Barry Fay, offered us the gig because we had been touring with, with Scorpions uh, for a couple of weeks. They were warming up for their performance at the US Festival. They had been in the studio. And uh, so on the last day, we play in Denver with the Scorpions, and the promoter runs in, Barry Fay, and it says, Hey, uh, I got this opening for the Oz Festival. You guys interested? You know, so we took it, and that was it. Now, 
Do you think Kevin DeBro um, is one of the more underrated, um, you know, rock or metal voices of all time? I mean, I, I feel like he doesn't get enough credit uh, for what what yeah, he contributed yeah. to it. Yeah, I you know I and and I think he's more in and I and I will compare him to let's say Brian Johnson or or even you know hey, and now there's been more ACDC singers with uh with Axl Rose yeah. <laughs> so say, yeah, AC no. DC singers <laughs> you know the fact that ACDC is not known for a ballad a, a you know for 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 writing ballads yeah and uh, that was pretty much at the core of Quiet Riot they were not I mean we had a couple of ballads obligatory ballads. I mean, of course, you've got Thunderbird, which is not really a, a, a male-female relationship love song. It's a love, you know, it's a it's a bro, brother, brotherhood yeah. song, you know. But, um, you know, there were some, we had Don't Want to Let You Go, which is like a mid-tempo ballad. Uh, Winners Take All, again, it's not really a, a relationship between, a, you know, you know, man, woman, whatever, nowadays. You know, uh, it was kind of like we are the champions, you know, winners take all like that. And uh, so it was not really a well-known ballad uh, singer. And back in the day, if you really wanted to resonate with the other half, the girls, you have to be able to sing a ballad. <laughs> you know, like, and that kind of, I, and I'm not selling, saying that Kevin was not a fan. He was a huge fan of uh, Steve Perry from Journey. Love Steve Perry. He love uh, Mickey Thomas. Uh, all of these guys, you know, who could sing a ballad but also rock out. But then again, Kevin was a metal singer. He really was at heart. But a more of an R&B influenced Steve Marriott type of metal R&B singer, you know, with a metal band, you know. And uh, so he was really, really underrated just because I don't think he was able to cross over. And he was purely a metal singer. He wasn't able to cross over as being a pop singer. Makes sense. Now, 40 years later, you're doing the uh, Metal Health Tour with Quiet Riot. How has that been going? Oh, it's been going great. I mean, you know, the guys that I'm playing with in Quiet Riot today, they were picked by those before me, before I joined the band. Uh, Alex Grossi, our guitar player, has been in the band for over 20 years now, and he was picked by Kevin and groomed by Kevin. Um, Jizzy uh, was picked by Frankie Benali, and he's been in the band for a while, five, seven years now. Uh, and then Johnny Kelly was picked by Frankie when Frankie could not go on tour anymore due to him taking chemotherapy and, and, you know, and being affected by, by cancer, you know? Uh, so the, you know, they were, they have been playing for a little bit uh, for a while uh, together before, before I joined the band. So it was just a matter of me getting back in touch with a hundred percent of who I am as a member of Quiet Riot which means taking me back to 1978. You know, yeah, when I go on stage, I, I don't even think about the 80s. I think about the original consciousness of the band. Uh, because, you know, in 1978, this is before Metal Health and before Randy joined Ozzy. And we were in the middle of the new wave punk uh, revolution. And it was becoming harder and harder for us to get gigs locally with Choir Riot because of the music that we did. And the audience has shifted. They were paying more attention to the new music. So we went from playing, you know, bigger places like the Star Wars to playing really smaller clubs, very small, with even smaller audience. <laughs> and, uh, but, it, but again, still, the passion was exactly the same. You know, we would go on stage there and play and just kick ass, and it didn't matter. So, you know, it it, it, it took a little bit this past year, uh, 2022, to re reestablish the band. Um, we did a lot of opening spots, and it didn't matter. We were opening in the middle, or we were like very begin. you know, the opener, We were if we were in the middle, special guests, or we were headlining some shows that we did, we just went out there and be ourselves. 
you know, just be the quiet riot. Uh, individually, uh, everybody finding who they are within the band. Uh, because I'm one of those guys that I, I never tell people what to do. You know, I mean, I might give my opinion of sound, but as far as their performance and who you want to be on stage, because I know what it's like in, to be in what is considered other people's bands. And the first thing that 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 I wanted to convey to the guys when I when I came back was that hey, this is our band. Our band. Be yourself. Have fun. You know? Uh and it's and it's wonderful. It's wonderful to go out there and I have so much respect and admiration and and I love my my choir ride brothers, you know. And the fact that we're able to go out there and with dignity celebrate the legacy of the band and the memory of, of Randy, Frankie, and Kevin. I, I couldn't ask for anything more. Now, recently you played uh, here in uh, Watertown, South Dakota, not too far away uh, mm -hmm. from right here in Montevideo, mm -hmm. Minnesota. So I know some of the Bigfoot listeners were at um, this show. Can you talk to me a little bit about playing um, in this area a couple weeks ago? Yeah, I mean, we love to play everywhere. I mean, there's, uh, you know, uh, when, we, when we get dates added you know I, I look at them and i go okay i haven't played there yet i'm looking forward to you know being in that area and and bringing our music uh to the fans it was great last yeah, question especially what watertown has a great new little airport oh okay why did they, yeah that services um denver connect airlines mm -hmm. And, and if anybody out there needs to fly out of Watertown, just take that airline. You don't have to drive all the way down to, uh, what is this, Sioux, uh, Sioux Falls? Yeah. Sioux Falls, yeah. Just, yes, right there in the middle of your town. Great, great, great airport, great airline. Yeah. Last question here. Any advice for young bass players out there? Oh, you know, playing any instrument. Music is a calling. It's, uh, it's, it's an art form. You know, just... Uh, advice i mean <laughs> you know i mean if you're asking me to give share to so to somebody you know uh, at this level 42 years of experience in in a couple of sentences it's not fair for me it's not fair for anybody who's going to be watching because they're, they're not going to get the full story but what i would say is you know find yourself with the instrument which is you know it's not just about absorbing knowledge yes you need that you know, it's like lear learning a language. You need to learn the words in the language so you can actually express yourself. That's why you're learning it. Not to mimic what everybody else is saying, but to actually use those words and put them into an expression that is true to yourself, whether you're asking a question or where you're delivering an answer. You know, and that's all it is, music. Music is, is just a language. Use it. All right. I want to thank you, Rudy, for your time. It was great talking to you today. You too, Mike. Thanks you for watching, everybody. You too. Bye-bye.